Okay, excellent. Oh, it, it's something that just appeared to me. Okay, hi everyone. Um, we'll just wait a couple of minutes as uh, members of the audience uh, come in, although I understand that <laughs> the door was open already uh, by mistake. But uh, we'll wait a couple of minutes as usual, just for anyone who's having any trouble uh, clicking the right buttons and getting the tech to work on demand and so on. And then we'll make a start. Maybe I should learn how to hum a good tune so I can entertain people as uh, as we wait for the first couple of minutes, but um, maybe not, maybe not. All right, okay, I think uh, 1601, nearly 1602, we can make a start. Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this, uh, the fifth of six uh, webinars in this particular series. And um, in a moment, as usual, Javaria will do the introductions and so on to the theme for today, the transnational right in world politics, and also our speakers, um, our excellent range of speakers, actually really interesting, looking forward to the insights on this big question as well. I just wanna say a few words about the global webinar series, why, why we have it, what it's for, what we're trying to do. Um, and it's basically fairly simple in that it was inspired in part by the decolonizing the curriculum decolonizing, decolonizing knowledge, global knowledge idea. The idea that there are some big world questions, but there are also multiple perspectives from which people can attempt to address those world questions. And the perspectives with which we address those questions can also vary according to who you are, where you live, where you work, the environment within which you're socialized, the kind of methodologies or theoretical perspectives that you choose to use and the particular periods of history that you may study. And there are a whole variety of uh, ways in which we can see some really big questions. So the idea was to use the platform that Zoom offers us, uh, a kind of bringing into our living rooms people from all around and, uh, and having a really interesting conversation with people who are serious thinkers and researchers and people who have given a lot of time and attention to some of these kinds of questions. So that basically it is. And second thing was really to try to make available resources to scholars, teachers, and students uh, because of the kind of range of knowledge which we're bringing to bear on these questions so that they can use them in their studies, sort of add those to their kind of reading lists or the viewing. We record the webinars <clears throat> and distribute them as widely as possible. And uh, we also wanted to build sort of some sort of partnerships and we have with several institutions and groups, uh, one in Brazil, in Cuba, in India, uh, in uh, other groups in London and, uh, and elsewhere as well in Germany. So we have got quite a range of people, but we're adding, trying to add uh, a couple more in South Asia. We already have uh, support of The Wire in New Delhi, a news investigative news website, but uh, we're working with uh, some a colleague at JNU in Delhi and also another colleague in Pakistan at NAST. And, we're hoping to sort of extend our networks in that kind of way. And through that, we kind of get people who are doing scholarship and serious thinking about questions that we don't know about, who are not in our kind of very hardwired global north networks. And one of the key challenges has been for Javaria and me and others who we've asked for help is, how do we actually break into networks of scholars and thinkers and so on outside of our, the ones we've established over so many years? And, we have kind of working our way slowly towards that, but it is quite a challenge, but it is an interesting challenge because we are there also discovering and finding out about all kinds of interesting people uh, that we never knew about as well. So that's a really interesting thing about it. And it's an organic process. It kind of changes as it goes. We can dip into major themes 
as we please and get interesting people into the conversation. So that's what we're broadly trying to do. So I'll stop there and ask Javaria to make an introduction to the theme and to the speakers today. Thank you. Great, thanks, Indrajit. Today's session is on the transactional right in world politics. So we've assembled a panel of four scholars who are working on various aspects of this theme. I'll introduce them now along um, with their topics because it's quite interesting to see uh, the sort of various um, aspects of uh, what we're doing today. So we have with us Dr. Nicholas Mickelson. He's from King's College London. His topic is the reactionary international. Dr. Nicholas Mickelson is a reader in the Department of War Studies at King's College. His research focuses on the contemporary new right in international relations, strategic communications and world politics, and the history of international thought. He is director of research in the King Center for Strategic Communications, and from January, he'll be the director of education in the Department of War Studies. We're also very pleased to have with us today Dr. Natasha Call of the University of Westminster, who is going to be speaking about Hindutva as a global force. Dr. Call is an academic and a novelist who publishes short fiction, nonfiction essays, and poetry, and also speaks to various gatherings of creatives, writers, poets, and academic scholars. She has authored numerous articles in edited books, journals, uh, newspapers, all on the themes of identity, economy, gender, social theory, feminist, post-structuralist, post-colonial critiques, technology, democracy, Kashmir, and Bhutan. At present, she is an associate professor in politics and international relations at the University of Westminster in London, and her previous affiliations have been with institutions in Hull, the UK, um, and Delhi in India. We also have with us today Dr. Mustafa Kutle from the City University of London, and his theme, um, his topic is the global political economy of right-wing populism, key puzzles and paradoxes. Dr. Kutle is a senior lecturer in the Department of International Politics at City University of London. His research focuses on comparative politics, political economy, shifts in international order, Turkish politics, and the politics of development in the global south. His published work includes articles in international affairs, government and opposition, and third world quarterly, and also policy reports and briefs for policy-making institutions. We also have with us Dr. Shin Fan, who is from the State University of New York in Fredonia, and he will speak about the right to talk about China, Chinese intellectuals, and the rise of emotional politics. Dr. Shin Fan is an associate professor of history at the State University of uh, New York. He is an intellectual historian with a strong research interest in global history. He's the author of World History and National Identity in China in the 20th Century. That's from Cambridge University Press, published this year. And he's also the second editor of a volume, Receptions of Greek and Roman Antiquity in East Asia, published by Brill in 2018. He's a fellow at the Joint Center on World Making from a Global Perspective in Germany, as well as a visiting scholar at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. Thank you all for joining us today. Great, thank you, Javaria. So we'll go in the order that we're on the poster. So Nicholas, you have 15 minutes to, to make your presentation. And uh, members of the audience can put into uh, the Q&A uh, a question at any time for any of our speakers, and, uh, and I'll curate them as we go along. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me. I, I'm really delighted to come and talk. Um, I mean, this thematic uh, of, of global knowledge is um, in particular really excited me, partly because this idea of what it would mean to have a global knowledge of the international or transnational right is, is pretty much exactly what I've been thinking about recently. And if, if I have time in the 15 minutes, I'll try and say something about I say, the decoloniality of the international right, if I can, um, but uh, we'll see if I, if I get there. Um, so what I'm going to do quickly is outline briefly at least the broad strokes of the argument I'm developing with, with colleagues, not on my own, so with Pablo de Orellana and Filippo costa Um, And the broad stroke of our argument is that we think the new right, um, or you know, the, the new right has an internationalism, right? It sings a song, an international, as it were, of the right. Um, but that international is sung by a very weird grouping. Um, it, the new rights refers, as we use it, to a variety of intellectual movements that emerged since the 1980s worldwide, many centered in the, in the West, but not all. So this includes very odd mixtures, so Reaganite economic conservatives, but also cultural critics, people like Alexandre Dugan, uh, Alain de Benoist, but also various populists um, or authoritarian political movements that have swept to power across the globe. So we see an international reactionary compact emerging between new right populists in democratic states like um, the United States, the UK, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Holland, um, Hungary, and populist leaders and authoritarians across the global south. So Brazil, India, Saudi Arabia, China, 
Russia, all of which advocate in a fairly collective manner for international normative change, which we see as expressed in a commonly articulated desire to dismantle liberal international norms, particularly rights and rule-based multilateralism and replace them with a very distinct vision of sovereignty. Um, they prioritize in the way in which they articulate together transactional deal-making, permitting and legitimizing um, spheres of exclusive competence. So we see this as effectively a, a transnational philosophy um, rooted in disdain for democratic pluralism, equality of people, issues around immigration, participatory politics, women's rights are regular thematics. And the links between these actors we see as circulating around a set of common practices seeking to correct what they see as the impacts of globalist institutions that emerged following the end of the Cold War. So um, we see this as, a, as, as an international thing in its fundamental nature. Um, but of course, there's huge disagreements within the academic communities about what's at stake in the transnational or international relationships between these diverse movements. The key question here relates to whether we're talking about a return to a more realist world orientated around states or something organized around something very different, different terms of reference, for example, using civilizational, religious or other forms of transnational terms of reference or identity to organize world politics in some way. Now, our argument is that these movements, whilst diverse and both in the types of actors they are and the types of places where they operate, um, with regards to their international, have some important cohesive, you know, cohesive factors, but also even where they disagree, they do so in a way that often facilitates cooperation um, around human rights, establishing spheres of competence and so on. So we think the transnationalism of the new right raises really important questions for international relations because they have the potential as a loose network or grouping to reorganize the rules of the game of international society and reform some very concrete institutions at work. Um, the most important of these is the one I'm going to focus about on today, which is that we see a very specific articulation of sovereignty playing out across these movements and groups, um, which is a kind of birth cultural, as we put it, um, conception of the nation state. Now, what's important about this conception of sovereignty in the nation state, um, as I understand it anyway, is that it's actually quite an intuitive idea of what a nation state is for, but it also cuts across to the left where you also see discourses that talk in very similar terms about the relationship between birth, culture, sovereignty, and the purpose of the nation state. Um, so there's an important way in which this is useful because it steals territory from their critics. Um, and I'll come back to this when we turn to the decoloniality of the new right, if I have time at the end. Look, we all know sovereignty is not a singular concept. It has a complex ambulant history, right? So distinctive conceptions of sovereignty exist, have existed in varieties of places and emerge throughout you know, the international history. Right? So when I'm talking about a particular or peculiar articulation of the nation state or sovereignty, I mean, it's very distinctive, right? It's not the same as other articulations of sovereignty, right? And I think that this particular way of talking about the nation state is central to the global culture wars that underpins the transnationalism of the new right. But look, to try and articulate this, let me kind of uh, uh, address the Nazi in the room, uh, as it were, proverbially speaking, which is to say that commonly when we talk about the internationalism of the new right, we talk about it as if, as if this was a kind of racist outgrowth of fascism in history, re-emerging in the international domain, um, often in the form of white nationalism. Now, it's really important, I think, to recognize that these movements do not follow a strictly fascist way of thinking about identity, right? The key thing about fascism is it's about remaking nature developing it and bending it to the will of man, right? So Uomo Fascista, the fascist man, is born out of the mind of the pioneering nationalists, but it has to be invented and molded and made, right? So it's a kind of vision of society is to do a purifying identity, which involves nurturing what they talked about in people like um, Mussolini, Prima de Rivera, nurturing spirito as the optimal realization of the biological identity of the race. So fascism features this revolutionary program for social change, right, that transforms society often from top to bottom. So race is the ground, but fascist man has to be made. Now, um, most of the 1930s European reactionary philosophy had this particular link between raza and spirito, right? This is the way in which it works in the Italian framing. Um, and the programmatic move is to heroically enact a new national identity, right, based on the ground of the race. Now, the new right internationally, retains this kind of axiomatic log log logic, but it abandons the program as it plays out. Instead of trying to program a future and transform it, most new right nationalist discourses are largely content to purify and unshackle national identity. It's a very passive approach to thinking about national identity. And it, this is tied to the international turn to culture, right? So it, it's all about a sort of 
so race appears here, it doesn't, it doesn't disappear, but the birth cultural axiom as a way of thinking about sovereignty diverges in really important ways from the Raza Spirito one, because it integrates race into a much broader conceptualization of identity, which is mediated by the constructive role of culture in history. So identity remains circumscribed by birth, which explains why the new right and most of its politicians internationally attack jus solis, the idea of citizenship for children of foreigners born in national territory, whether in India or in Italy. But it is culture that emerges as the immutable and primordial element of the national culture, removing need for active self-improvement, rather leaving only a passive protection of cultural purity. So birth is kind of like the limit condition of culture, binding past and future belonging into existing membership. But it's much more slippery than previous articulations of sovereignty in relationship to identity. Race, of course, remains part of birth culture, but it's subsumed as an accident of birth. So it never needs to be explicitly articulated. This is why the new right very rarely talks about race, um, if ever talks about race. It's the link between birth and culture that's important. And the reason it's important is also because it's very difficult to critique. Because, of course, many people on the left have a birth cultural conception of identity, too. They talk about cultural heritage as a code for articulating identity all the time. Right? So birth culture is the core, certainly, of the European new rights electoral and discursive machinery. It's particularly evident in all their foundational texts. So if you look at something like ben the Benoist and Champatier's Manifesto for the New Right in the year 2000, they're very explicit. They cite, this is cited very widely. Right? They conceptually refute the existence of humanity as a social and political category. So their point is, to quote them, mankind as such does not exist, for its affiliation to humanity is always mediated by cultural belonging. So it's a really important quote because it really clearly articulates the conception of political sovereignty that they're developing. These ideas drew very explicitly on French anti-liberal late 19th century nationalists like Moras and Barres. And the whole idea here is to locate national belonging in relationship to a conceptualization of culture that is determinant, immutable and eternal. Right? The international new right, as I see it, coalesces around this concept of the nation as a vestibule of birth culture, which produces a particular way of thinking about how sovereignty plays out in world politics, right? So all transactions in world politics are between birth cultures, predicated on spheres of influence, which are defined by appeal to those birth cultures. So you could look at this in Ukraine, in Taiwan, in Kashmir, very similar discourses play out, right? The transnational is very clear in the European new right, because when they talk about their relationships with the rest of the world, the European New Right proposes that its birth cultural conception of the nation is good because it's anti-liberal, right? Liberalism is criticized for destroying the autonomy of cultures. The history of the West, as they articulate it, is a history of ongoing cultural as well as political colonialism. So people like the Benoist, they argue for their transnational right project on the grounds that the project of decolonization is incomplete and it continues through international aid and UN-led liberal paternalism. So the answer the new right develops, the answer that allows them to build international linkages, is that they want to restore an independent status to diverse birth cultures and indigenous worldviews and international relations and to suggest that people belonging to birth cultures must actively work towards their national cognitive emancipation from the baggage of liberal modernity, only if necessarily violently, right? They're not necessarily committed to a violent emancipation. The global new right claims its international marginality vis-a-vis -vis liberalism and globalism, which are understood as the ideological representative of colonial modernity and international thought, is the marker of its virtue. Right? So they are the defenders, as they see it, of birth cultural sovereignty in world politics. That's their rhetorical move. That's their rhetorical pitch, which allows them to build transnational linkages. So I think this is the reason why, if I had to make a slightly kind of, uh, a, a slightly kind of uh, a contentious claim, that we should think about the transnational new right as decolonial in important ways. Because the birth cultural axiom within the new right has an intellectual passage in common here with decolonial thought. Of course, we all know that decolonial movements weren't non-nationalist or reluctantly nationalist, right? And it's obvious that conceptions of sovereignty and nationality, like those innovated by Moras and Barres around culture, didn't pass unchanged through the process of decolonization. So developing a global knowledge of the international transnational new right requires, I would suggest, a properly decolonial intellectual history of nationalism that refuses to ignore the creative impact that decolonization movements had on the intellectual history of nationalism. That is to say, in reworking ideas and practices of the nation state that are playing out in various ways in the reactionary forms of sovereignty we see playing out today.
Sovereignty was reworked, of course, to challenge and combat imperial patterns of uneven and combined development and imperial racial hierarchy, right? But the proclamation, of course, of the new right, their claim to have an anti-colonial sensibility, and you see this particularly in Eastern Europe in relationship to Western Europe, right? So this kind of interesting claims around where the coloniality is, right? Suggests a much more complex conversation between East and West than is often articulated when we talk about the transnational new right. The new right is, um, not an outgrowth of European fascism, it's, it's a successful competitor on the right. It has successfully outcompeted fascist ideas for the same market. So the European New Right, I think, has in some important ways um, stolen ideas of its critics here and repurposed them to reactionary ends, right? Because in this way, you know, the New Right is doing almost what it's, the right has always done, which is acting as an avatar of entrenched capital. But the transnational new right is in important ways, I think, um, transnational because it's decolonial, at least because it claims to be. And this decoloniality is a keynote in the reactionary internationale. The song of sovereignty sung by these movements is what allows them to tie together relationships between, you know, people like Orban and Bolsonaro with people like Modi and, and potentially Xi and so on, when they think about how international politics should be organized. So the point rhetorically, is that the core conception of birth culture has a transnationalism at its heart. And that's rooted in a particular understanding of history that is, is in some ways explicitly anti-colonial. So it's quite an important and interesting rhetorical move that's trying to capture space um, in, in, in world politics. I'm gonna stop there because I think I've already run over my time, but I hope that was interesting. That was really interesting. And actually you had a couple of minutes left um, oh, really? OK, I can keep going <laughs> if you like, but I'll stop. I'll stop and let's. Yeah, people. well, I mean, I think you've given us a massive amount uh, to think about there. Um, so I'm inviting members of the audience and also members of the panel, should they wish to, just to raise their hand or if you're in the audience to go into the Q&A and uh, type in your questions, please. And I'll, I'll do my best to to manage and uh, to direct them and so on. But you just mentioned towards the very end um, this. Uh, you said the new right, the global new right, is an avatar of transnational capital. Can you just explain that? Well, I, I think so I, that probably I, I said that slightly too slickly. What I said is how the inter what I meant to say was the international right always, in some forms, plays a role as a as a defender of entrenched capital in more or less all its locations, even when it's presenting itself as as its is as its as its enemy. So right, one of the key moves the transnational move, right always makes is to is to read its critics and borrow their best arguments. Right? Mm. <laughs> so that, that, is, that is the central move they make. And that's why they're so successful in my reading anyway, certainly since the 1980s. So, so part of that move is to do with essentially incorporating the criticism whilst, whilst cutting it off, whilst mm. cutting off its bite. That's what I, that's sort of what I meant. Does that, does that make sense? Um, sure. Yeah, that, but I just wondered in terms of the, the individuals and the groups that you look at um, who are kind of represent the transnational new right, in what ways uh, other than, if you like, economic philosophy, perhaps, uh, do they not also see that actually transnationalizing capital uh, is one of the key forces behind liberalism? which is kind of global, globalist in character. So that, isn't there a contradiction between being an avatar of transnational capitalism at the same time as being critical of liberalism, uh, which is equally connected with transnational capital, no? No, they, they, are, they are resolute critics of globalism almost everywhere. Every, almost everywhere you find them, they are, they are resolute critics of, of, hmm. of, of globalism. In important ways, they're not, always though i mean america is quite a good example where you have quite a weird mixture between um on the right anyway between kind of explicit anti-globalists of the of the ban on variety yeah. right and, and this plays out and um, across europe as well i mean it's slightly more complicated elsewhere um but you have a kind of economic protectionist wing which yeah. says that the problem with liberalism is, you know, it, it's sending jobs abroad and and oh. and you know and, and ruining the life of the little man, right? Whilst you have another wing, um, which is essentially the Trump wing or the Johnson wing, right? Oh. Which oh. is clearly tied into um, 
to, to precisely the same forces that produce that kind of transnational capital. So there's quite a complex relationship here. I wasn't, what I wasn't meaning to say is that they are an avatar of transnational capitalism in some kind of conspiratorial manner. That's not what I mean, right? I don't mean that they're like an outgrowth of, of, yeah. of capitalism. What I mean is that they defend entrenched economic interests generally wherever they are, right? In, their, in the practice of what they do, right? And I, I think this is one of the reasons why they borrow from their critics. Okay, got a couple of questions in the Q and A. Um, one from uh, a suspiciously named individual called Niall Mitchelson, so maybe a relative, uh, asks: Is this phenomenon a reaction to globalization's homogenizing effects? Well, I mean, yeah, this is the kind of Manuel Castells argument, right? Oh. That um, I mean, kind of politics of identity, that um, that. The, or, you know, the fragmentation argument that you have globalization and at the same time the formation of local identities. Yes, I mean to, to some extent you have you have tapping into the formation of local identities, but I'm not. It's not really my my interest is not so much in why people are attracted to identity. Right, that's not that's not so much my 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 set of interests. What I'm interested in are is the intellectual history of particular ways of thinking about about the nation fundamentally and how that plays out in world politics and how, how the sort of rules of the game are articulated around those particular ways of thinking about identity. So, so for me, the, the question is not, you know, does, did globalization cause the rise of the new right? I mean, hmm. everything causes everything, right? So, I mean, yes, the, the history of, of, that involved globalization has obviously got a relationship to it in a variety of different ways, some to do with changing economic dynamics on the ground in different countries, whether that's in developed states or, or or you know, sort of developing states, right? Transnational capitalism has, and its globalization has had different impacts in different places, and but almost everywhere they've been negative for some groups, and those groups have make make appeals to certain articulations of identity in, in relationship to it. But I think the transnational new right is interesting because um, it has developed a particular set of answers to the questions thrown up by. And don't really like globalization, shall we say, um, you know, the, the post 9-11 or post financial crisis world, right? Um, that kind of particular, the particular constellation of problems that has emerged over the last 20 years that are really convincing. Right? I mean, I don't mean I'm convinced by them. I mean that as, what I mean is that there are a whole load of audiences that listen to the arguments they make and find them compelling. Right. And those audiences are quite diverse and move across different national communities. So I think that's more the, the point, because I'm, I'm interested in strategic communication. I'm more interested in the rhetorical appeal of certain arguments and how they um, build, build relationships. I see lots more questions. Go on. Yeah, there's um, a question from Sean Stars, who's a member of our department of City, who asks, can there really be a transnational right movement that's anything comparable to a communist international? The latter, of course, which was based on international working class solidarity against capitalism, whereas those who prioritize their own national sovereignty from the right want to carve out their own ethno national state within global capitalism, that is not overthrow it, um, and so on. Well, so yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, the reason we've used uh, I've used the concept of um, international is, is partly to provoke, right? Um, um, but look, uh, is there a relationship? Yes, I think there is. I mean, in the way in which they talk about, um, they talk about what they do. So there's a, a British example. And Tomlinson, so when in years to, when Tomlinson, um, who's obviously a right-wing British um, figure, when in years to come, the generations that follow study the history of this period, there's one year that will stand out. There is one year that every school child will know, and that year is the year 2016, because in 2016, we saw the witness the beginning of a global political revolution. That is one that's not going to stop, and it's one that's going to roll out across the rest of the free world. Let me give you some more examples of the kinds of things I'm talking about. Here's Trump. Each of us here today is the emissary of a distinct culture, a rich history, and a people bound together by ties of memory, tradition, and the values that make our homelands like no one else on earth. That's why America will always choose independence and cooperation over global governance, control, and domination. I honor the right of every nation in this room to pursue its own customs, beliefs, and traditions. The United States will not tell you how to live or work or worship. We only ask that you honor our sovereignty in return. Right? The way in which they rhetorically position their project is as an internationalist project. That's the point, right? They don't position themselves as anti-internationalist. They position themselves as explicitly internationalist in a very, in a very kind of clear manner. They see themselves as launching a revolution in the name of birth cultures. 
And so, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not an international in the sense that it's, it's post-national, right? It's an international in the sense that it's international. Uh, it's interested in the formation of an international around national communities or national cultures. And I think that that song is not, a, is not parochial in the sense, they don't frame it as parochial. Mm. They frame it as something that the globe has an interest in. Mm. But given its kind of attachment to, to sovereignty, uh, I, I suspect that if, if governments of this ilk were in power in significant range and number of countries, uh, you would see a kind of set of realist sort of uh, international relations, uh, but also perhaps quite aggressive given the, the cultural elements of their program and the fact that as a result of liberalism and, and global migrations and so on, you actually have mixing, right? You have minorities all around the world and so could this not actually be not necessarily a kind of unifying, it might be a unifying moment in its inceptive period, but actually a kind of very aggressive warlike um, redistributive kind of movement uh, if it were to get into any significant positions of actual, you know, kind of interaction and power. I mean, I think, I think, I think they are in, in significant power in large, large number of places in the world. So I, I, think, I think in a sense, we're already seeing the implications play out in climate change conferences and so on. I, as in, I think COP is quite a good example of the ways in which lots of th these ideas are already fairly entrenched. Now, in terms of international rules and norms, I don't see them as strictly speaking realist. I think quite a lot of, um, I mean, it's, it's possible to read them in realist terms and realists would say this is just the natural rules of the game, but I don't, I'm an intellectual historian, I see a very distinct idea around sovereignty at play. Um, and the claim that what's going on is in international relations is birth cultures um, defending essentially their territory, right? And, and also expressing the rights of action they have. It has some very particular normative implications, right? So birth culture obviously subsumes human rights, right? And the idea of equality of people as well as environmental norms and so on. But transactions between states um, largely subsume international law. So diplomacy, um, multilateralism, the market are all, are all subsumed with an idea of birth cultural sovereigns interacting. It's not exactly the same as, as, as sort of states like billiard balls interacting, because at the end of the day, as long as you respect my spheres of exclusive competence that are linked to my birth culture, right? It makes perfect sense that you would be free to do what you like elsewhere. So there's, a, there's a kind of jostling hmm. implicit to here, which makes claims around who has normative um, normative rights to to take action in certain spaces. This is explicitly the argument used um, by by nationalists um, in, in this discourse. They say, well, yes, you're free to act within these spaces, but yeah, will it involve conflict? Of course it will. But it's not a kind of it's not a Darwinian struggle for survival. Um, and the assumption is is that birth cultures are. Uh, should be allowed to compete because that's how, you know, in a sense, the, the truth of the birth culture is expressing itself mm. in, in world history. So, you know, that doesn't necessarily imply um, world war, but it certainly implies a necessity of friction as the natural condition of world politics. So, yeah, I think it's likely to lead to, to, to conflict in the long run, yes. Mm. But unlike kind of realist theory, I suspect that this would be conflict which may not necessarily be driven by sort of, you know, power as such, but by these cultural attachments, which cross national boundaries, such that if you had neighboring and, and rival kind of cultures, if you like, but they're kind of living in each other's societies, and there is any allegations of mistreatment of minorities, et cetera, then you could quite clearly see a sort of very conflictive uh, kind of politics going on. Undoubtedly, you see exactly this discourse in Ukraine, um, and the, the, Russia, Russian, the Russian articulation or particular version of birth cultural uh, nationality is, is, is central to the way in which they talk about Ukraine, they talked about Crimea and so on. You know, there's an, you know, protecting protecting the, 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 the Russian Rusky Mir and, and so on, right? So there's a, yeah, absolutely, there's this very clear articulation within this discourse of of you know the rights of a culture right the right rights of membership to a culture um, mm. but at the same time right the, they, there's also a, a a call for other people to be respected for, for it so you know there's there's all kinds of support for repression happening far away elsewhere in the world right so you know you have criticism of of modi's um you know uh, uh, of modi's rules but from johnson for example mm. but they're mm. quite they're quite 
like res restrained criticisms, right? Given given the citizenship laws and so on. You know, there's a kind of acceptance in in, in new right discourse that certain mm. kinds of things are within the sphere of competence of a state. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely a rolling back on universalism. Um, yeah. uh, I think. Just have one question uh, from the audience as well. Um, uh, Anna Kierkegaard from Malmo, doing peace research, says, interested in the discussion, but wonders whether the conceptualizations of right and left are really useful when discussing this new development, particularly if we want to depart from localities rather than universalist approach? Or do we need new ways of thinking of this? That's a super interesting claim. So no, I think I think there's a very, um, I think there's a, a very um, clear intellectual history that runs back and it is linked to conservative philosophy, right? And I think, I think there's not a, um, you know, these aren't ideas that emerge from nowhere. They have an intellectual history and you need to chart that intellectual history. And then, and you know, that, that is, that's very easy to do in some places and less easy elsewhere. And then you have to chart their international linkages. Um, it's true they don't, no gene, intellectual genealogy is, is entirely linear. They're not all going to the same place, right? Maybe I'm telling a slightly too simple story and charting it back essentially to a group of French nationalists. Um, but, but, you know, the, the, the trick I think is, is when trying to make sense of these movements is to try and work out where they share um, essentially intellectual resources mm -hmm. and how they pull those together into the arguments they make in relationship both to their domestic audiences and to their international audiences. And I think, I think that they remain right wing movements. And I think in important ways, the ideas are, are rooted in conservative history. So I think, I think it, it retains a bit, of, a bit of utility still, I think. Great, thank you, Mike. There are loads of other questions actually, which uh, I'm sure people would ask and I have too. Um, but we're going to move on now to uh, our second speaker. So Nicholas, thank you so much. Pleasure. For kicking us off uh, in such a stimulating way. Um, we we'll move to the next speaker, Natasha uh, Cole from uh, University of Westminster. Natasha, you have about 15 minutes. Yes, it's 16.37 now. So, okay, remind me at uh, in 15 minutes time. Okay, uh, well, um, so, um, right, I want to first uh, actually say something about uh, the introduction. I have no idea where that was from, but just so everyone is clear, I never had any affiliations at University of Delhi, and that's not what I sent to you. Uh, the relevant affiliation in this case for me would be as reader in politics and international relations at the University of Westminster, and um, and of course, previously uh, with, a, with my previous career as an economist. Um, so I have no idea where all that writing in newspapers, etc. But if anybody is, uh, you know, wants to sort of refer to what my work over time. Um, there's uh, the most recent book is called Can You Hear Kashmiri Women Speak, which seems rather apt in this instance, especially, um, and, and also other previous work. So that's, that's all at my website in the CV at nitashakol.com. Okay, so the talk today, I'm going to really be drawing upon because 15 minutes is not a long time to, to be able to go through a lot of the ideas. Um, so I will draw upon elements of previous work, which uh, which will draw from um, there's a uh, art, and, and I'll just list those sources: rise of the right wing in India, Hindutva development mix, Modi myth, and dualities about the rise of the right in India, uh, but the political project of postcolonial neoliberal nationalism, uh, the misogyny of authoritarians in contemporary democracies, uh, Kashmir is to India as China is to Xinjiang and Islamophobia in India. So what I speak on will, will actually draw from those specific sources. Now, um, so I listened to uh, the previous paper with great interest, but I have a completely different take on, uh, you know, on the nature of the right wing. Um, so I, I do agree that they are, of course, transnational in the ways in which they, uh, you know, share strategies and they have many rhetorical commonalities and the role of capital in, in all of this. Um, but um, but there are also, I think, um, but I would definitely, for instance, not, I feel, I, I would think that there's a worry in refining their, um, you know, the birth boundary thing refines lots of things. Um, in, in ways that, so I wouldn't say they're decolonial at, at all, like that, that would be a, a big problem. I would want to not 
agree to that, and maybe we can discuss that later. Um, and so instead of instead of looking at this from the point of view of sovereignty, which to quote Harry Hinsley, you know, creates more problems than it solves, or as many problems as it as it solves, I want to come at this by looking at the ways in which uh, you know in um, in which these new right projects, by which I mean specifically the uh, you know these these projects that are the twentieth twenty first century self described right wing. Um, parties or projects that are successful in multiple countries globally. That um, So I see them as working through the contradictions that were initially set up by liberalism between, neoli between neoliberalism and nationalism in order to create hegemony. So these projects create hegemony by working through the contradictions that liberalism set up by saying neoliberalism is this thing and nationalism is this thing. One of them is economic and the other is cultural. Uh, and uh, and throughout uh, throughout you know I will I will of course talk about India but I'm also very aware of the you know the practice that has that is often the case of bringing the non-West as datum so I don't want to do that and I want to say that when I speak about India I'm not only speaking about India I'm using speaking about India but the larger trajectory of my thought is to look at uh, you know the new global right. So I think that these projects have uh, ha are actually not marked by uh, are actually marked by a shape shifting strategy and many many policy inconsistencies that all of them demonstrate that uh, you know they of course work on the navigate the policy identity link but there are and there are different configurations in these countries but there are similarities and one key similarity is the way in which they are riven through with these contradictions and the contradictions that they have are also uh, so I. So I'm arguing that these contradictions are, are par part and parcel of how they work to create hegemony by being different things to different, uh, you know, to people who, who have actually very opposed interests. And in this sense, they are, um, so, you know, so something like in Bukla in India, for instance, Modi's project is, is all things to all people. So it's capitalists to the, you know, to the capitalists, it's kind of pro-business, uh, it's integral humanist to, to, the, uh, to, to the poor, it's, you know, it's, it's this and it's that, and it's also lots of things. So it's fundamentally, these projects are fundamentally uh, driven with these, with these contradictions. And these contradictions are not a problem for them. These contradictions are what they succeed through because in, in kind of making, running these contradictions together is how they create that hegemony. I also want to emphasize that they are, however, on one aspect, they are ideologically coherent, which is how they rely upon misogyny. And I think that, uh, and there is, it's too much to go into right now, but there is a specific use of misogyny that these projects make in, in, consolid in building and consolidating supporter identities, in sustaining and defending militarized approaches to policy, uh, and, in and in the ways in which they scavenge on progressive ideals rather than simply rejecting them. So, um, so, so that is something that is that is very systematically common to all of them. Now, um, so and um, and again, another thing is that. So for me, uh, someone like Trump or, or Johnson cannot be understood without the, you know, without the prior understanding of an Erdogan or a Modi. I think that these projects, before they became as clearly visible in the global north, were actually much more visible in many countries of the global south, and Erdogan being an, being an, a kind of early example. In my in some of the work that I quoted on on uh, in relation to Modi, I talk about how, uh, you know, for instance, uh, the the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the the kind of nation nationwide ideological parent, the right-wing ideological parent of this, of the ruling BJP, that that has, that and the BJP has over time had this kind of curious way in which they've moved between an idea of economic nationalism via Swadeshi to an, a project like Make in India, which is, you know, which is at, on the one hand kind of pro-business, but also a, a, a lot of, um, but also not straightforwardly so. And uh, re more recently, you would have heard Erdogan saying, you know, the, the problem with um, with the economy is actually like they're fighting an economic war of independence. So the 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 idea here is that the that that neoliberalism and nationalism are not only not opposed, but that the imaginaries of nation and economy are co-constructed by these projects in order to get consent for their policy regimes, which have many, many contradictions. So they're constantly borrowing and shifting metaphors over so that the uh, uh, surgical strike on Kashmir then becomes a surgical strike on uh, on the black economy, uh, inverted commas, in, in during demonetization. So this, this even, even linguistically, this construction, this, this opposition, while there is actually not there and they're constantly moving between these domains, the problem the problem with the neoliberal national binary, of course, is that it facilitates a very systematic understanding of local versus international, 
uh, material versus symbolic and regressive versus progressive. And I think that that is that that systematic understanding mapping of that binary is not, uh, you know, it's 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 um, it, it, it does it doesn't help us um, and and the other kind of the other way in which these projects both in the the formerly colonizer as well as colonized countries work is to mimic as well as repudiate a certain idea of the West so that the West is understood as at the same time as the uh, you know the the for instance the colonizer um, but also at the same time as the the entity that champions human rights so that demands for human rights within uh, countries of the non west can be can be seen as western projects while at the same time wanting to also say that oh well we're we're anti you know we're, we're we have this legacy of anti colonial purity because the west was the colonizer and they violated our rights so these these sorts of contradictions they they're shot through with these sorts of contradictions and um, Another example would be, for instance, to say that, you know, we'll have the malls like, um, you know, you, streets like Oxford Circus and huge malls and all of that, yet at the same time not to have Western corruption. So so certain ideas of the same entity, this, the same sorts of entity gets used in, in, uh, in these complex, uh, con deliberately contradictory ways in order to tell these very convincing stories that are successful for these projects. What they often result in, of course, is a banal huge level of banalization of violence. And in the Indian case, for example, but not just in the Indian case, I mean, the parallels even with the UK are striking, uh, uh, labels such as anti-national, uh, in the Indian case, sed seditious, but the wider securitization of dissent. And these take, again, different forms in these countries, but broadly speaking, it is about making, you know, protests and dissent problematic. It is about um, uh, making um, critical thinking and critical education problematic as being somehow anti-national or, you know, kind of uh, uh, um, traitorous. Um, in the Indian case, the so so this is how this kind of the Hindutva project works. The Hindutva and and I also would would actually say that these are very necessarily supremacist projects, of uh, you know of either of racial supremacism, of kind of ethnic, religious supremacism, like in the Indian case, for example, quite clearly a Hindu supremacist project that, that this is, so that not all citizens are, of course, citizens in the same way. And, uh, you know, however many hundred years back their, uh, their, their uh, identities go back into that, into that boundary. Um, uh, Modi is seen as the save, not just the savior of the nation, again, a longer story, I can't go into great detail here, but Modi is seen as the savior of the nation, so much so that 2014, when he came to power, is seen as the actual time that India became independent. So people assert that India did not become independent in 1947, it became independent in, in 2014. Um, and um, uh, the, the RSS, this, this body that I referred to before, uh, which was founded in 1925, and, uh, you know, and then there's other important moments that happen in the history of this country, uh, of, of this body, in 57, you know, with uh, Jansung, then the BJP in the 1980s, and in 19, early 1990s, the simultaneous arrival and, and kind of economic, in the economic person, and also this kind of the simultaneity, basically, of the opening up of the economy, the liberalization, as it was called, as well as the the rise of Hindutva and these two things again so too too much to go into here but the, the kind of the contemporaneity of these two things have often been seen as a puzzle and in my work I seek to explain why actually that's that's not as much as of a puzzle if we look at it a certain way uh, the dualities in the Indian case and in the Hindutva kind of version are also around how co corporate versus grassroots the idea of Bharat which is India in Hindi uh, Bharat versus India uh, national versus international is systematically manipulated uh, along, you know, on on uh, same sorts of lines. And of course, Modi as the leader is projected as I argue, a set in in a you know in a, in the way of making a political myth as being ascetic, paternal, and efficient, um, as the champions of Hindus, but also the champion of business, uh, supported not just by the corporates, which has of course played an important role, but also the R RSS. And in all of this, the you know in these Modi waves, the role of technology is is um, is supremely important. The the diaspora. Finally, I I just want to sort of also say something about the so the the global aspect of it is that this these sorts of things are are also being repurposed in the diaspora as you know at, which which is doing two things. It's creating a homogenous identity of Indian as Hindu, so that all Indian diaspora are essentially somehow all Hindu diaspora, which is not correct. And secondly, leg the legitimization of Modi's policies. In part, there's there's a role also for the, in, in other work, sorry, I forgot to mention one article on um, th this year on um, 
on the paradoxes and entanglements of Indian uh, of uh, Indian diaspora in the West. So this uh, these um, the, in in part that is done through the sorts of politicians, through the paradoxical figures of politicians who who embody uh, cultural nationalism along with um, uh, you know who who racialize discourse along with cultural nationalism to embody a politics of respectability. People like uh, you know Preeti Patel, uh, the Home Secretary in the UK, previously someone like Nikki Haley in the US. Um, so so there's that sort of effect of the diaspora in in kind of the way in which Hindutva works globally, and also then more specific uh, endeavors around the use of spirituality, uh, around the use of spectacle, and the way in which technology is used. Um, the uh, in addition to the emotional link uh, that and uh, you know and the activism, including on university campuses by the youth, that. Um, that works to kind of work that that works with the diaspora generational anxieties. So um, there's um, I, I don't know how how am I doing for time? Do I have three? Four, have about three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, maybe I could. Um, oh, that there is maybe one last thing I want to say and then stop because I do want to take some questions on this. Uh, and of course, in the and how this works, the you know the kind of the Hindutva is a global thing. It, there's there's partly this idea of the model minorities, Indians as the model minorities, Hindus as the mi model minorities in the West. So there's there's that along with the global Islamophobia that that plays a very important role in uh, in in let in this repurposing of Hindutva that you know Muslims are a problem everywhere sort of uh, uh, a rhetoric that is very common to find amongst um, their supporters. The uh, and and this Islamophobia in the Indian case, of course, works multi-dimensionally. It works to create. Uh, it works in ways that the Indian Muslim is all is always a suspect citizen, uh, and uh, the the Kashmiri Muslim is a latent terrorist. The Muslim immigrant, uh, you know, for instance, even refugees, the Rohingya refugees, for example, are a pest, are an invasive pest, and the Muslim nation state of Pakistan is an existential other. So there are various uh, kind of levels and and um, relationalities with which this in, uh, Islamophobia works, as um, and and as these projects, of course, not not just in India but all but specifically in India also create this. Um, these uh, very very violent outcomes um, that are that are about purifying identity, that are about asserting a certain very clear kind of Hindus descended from the Aryan, Aryan race and therefore superior. And this sort of race thought goes very kind of deep into the RSS kind of founders. Their very founders, the books written by their founders, kind of have that as as quite central to it. So so I I would not say these are you know I would say these are definitely for me these are projects uh, kind of authoritarian projects that are subverting democratic principles they are working with these various transnational linkages they're working through the contradictions that were set up between neoliberalism and nationalism and they um and and they are uh, and they quite uh, consciously and deliberately and with intent seek to build linkages with each other uh, and um, and and this is uh, you know this was so um, this is this is an avowed kind of avowed aspect of what they do they want to I think there was a document earlier this year uh, um, which you know which which was re which revealed that in one of the ministerial meetings there was a suggestion to build links with right wing uh, movements in other in other countries so this is there's a very clear understanding and I cite that in the uh, international studies review paper so there's a, there's a very clear uh, way in which they see what they what they are doing and uh, and it's and and it's for the moment at least in in multiple countries they're succeeding and and, and the um, and and partly our methodological nation statism and the ways in which work within global south and global north gets uh, studied separately or understood or analyzed separately is also partly i think at a, a part of the problem here because these are you know while while people are often thinking within national boundaries these are truly uh, very uh, you know kind of, kind of critically global projects in what they seek to do uh, that's it thank you great thank you very much i'm I, I can see Nicholas uh, shifting in his seat, probably wanting to ask you a lot of questions. Um, I, I'd like to ask both you and Nicholas really as well, is that the way you've described Hindutva and also by extension, many other new right or right wing uh, movements uh, and their appeals, they're regressive and progressive. Uh, they're national as well as uh, global. Uh, they're committed to one particular kind of culture. Uh, they mix up and contradict one another in the way in which they get their, um, win their influence. 
they're different things to different people, a sort of empty signifier box, which says, here I am, make me what you want me to be. And that's fine. Now, we've seen these kind of movements before, uh, but I just wonder, what is the root reason you would say, or set of reasons, why there's such traction for what are clearly, if you look intellectually, as you do, and uh, many of us do as well, we see the contradictions, they are glaring, they're staring you in the face. You summarize many of them. But what is it that gives it that such great appeal across such wide ranges of people in so many countries in this particular kind of last decade or so? What is it that gives that appeal almost universally at this time? Right, so I think that, um... I think that to to answer your the second part of your question first, I think that there is a uh, there is a, a very important role of these leaders. That, for instance, you know, were it not for these specific individuals, I don't think these projects. You know, there's there's a the the role of leadership is important, and and that is a and many of these projects kind of coherently. I mean, for instance, in in the uh, in the Indian case, there's there's Modi, and then you know, there's someone like Adityanath. There are specific people who are who have become these these um, repositories of and, and kind of you know almost almost like a uh, interchangeable with the idea of the project so the leadership does have an important role uh, they also have a lot of mobilization uh, on you know at, at grassroots level in the Indian case again with uh, you know with entities like the RSS and various kinds of other youth mobilization um, sorts of uh, youth and and specific wings of the Sangh Parivar of the family of Hindu nationalist organizations specific wings targeting different demographics hmm. so there is that work the um, the um, the if you want a kind of a, a, a really kind of broad net answer to why they are successful, I think it's it's the decimation of education and critical thinking. I mean, I think it's the way in which uh, the you know in our time globally education has come under attack, and the neoliberalization of education, the way in which kind of you know you study these subjects, and then this is what people do with their lives. So the the idea of the the I would bring up the link between critical thinking and totalitarianism from Arendt, and I would say this is there's a key part of this is the overall wider thing to do with how critical thinking is being attacked, how universities, you know, the the the, the kinds of mobilization against critical race theory, the kinds of mobilizations against academics, and uh, what we write and say in India against here, a Tory MP is talking about, you know, teachers who criticize whatever should be uh, fired. So this this is it's it's actually very palpable and perceptible. The, the attack on education, I think, is the is the broader part of this story. The, to to answer your first question, I think that it, it's not. They are lots of things uh, to different people, and they shape shift, and they have a forked tongue maintenance of specific dualities. But the bit about the about the uh, kind of local regressive international etc. There, I was saying that these binaries are there. I wasn't saying these projects are them. I was saying that neoliberalism and nationalism are understood so that capital has a liberating effect, for instance, and, you know, local or the local issues are regressive. And those systematic understandings are what are manipulated by these projects as they kind of work through with you know, simultaneously constructing ideas of what the economy is and what the nation is. And the, the reason I call it the post-colonial neoliberal nationalism is the post-colonial aspect there is, of course, the way in which the idea of the West is used and uh, imaginaries of pride and futurity are used so that, you know, the, these projects promise a return to the future as the past. And, uh, you know, for uh, so it, whether it's make America great again, you know, um, and Brexit the, uh, to make Britain the way it used to be or India the way it used to be. So all of these regardless of what happened right now it's about going back to that future as a past and again the reason I would argue that works is because we do not have an a, a good kind of vocabulary to talk about and this is the uh, the Kashmir India Xinjiang article the uh, a good vocabulary to talk about colonialism that that is not seen as a shame of colonizing but as of being colonized so the idea, I mean, again, longer thing to, to explain here, but the idea is there that that to have been colonized is understood as a shame and to have colonized is understood as a matter of pride. And that very problematic systematic understanding of injury and, and more, more, you know, kind of moral shame 
and humiliation gets used in these projects in the way in which they give their their you know their kind of followers a sense of pride above and everything else which is why people feel their supporters feel so strongly about not criticizing the country abroad because they have put up with this very systematic way in which you know in which for instance if there's a if there's a um, what's it called the the thing that goes to mars you know if there's a if there's a space launch or whatever then there would be a, a you know cartoons of um of the this country that can't you know people being un under underclothed or underfed so there's a very systematic history of a racialized hierarchy that is about the colonizers and the colonized and these projects are kind of saying no there is a way in which this you know we can we can give you a sense of pride uh, but of course, at the same time as they're giving people that sense of pride, they are also actually not repudiating any of these economic linkages because they are, you know, they, they are um, at, at that level of, of sort of corporate and, and financial connection. There's, there's no, no sovereignty really at all. So it's, um, it, it's, that, it's that pride thing that I think they, they really work with. And the reason they can is because the, the, the past isn't over yet and the hierarchies of the past still persist in the present. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question in the uh, Q&A. Um, this person is wondering if you can go a bit more into the depth, into depth, whether you agree or disagree with, with Nick, what Nicholas was saying about defining the transnational right as decolonial. How do you see the Indian radical right dealing with white supremacy entrenched in the Western radical right? Right. So I'm, I'm just looking at the, uh, at the questions here. Um, so, uh, Nicholas, that's very clever of you. You've gone there. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's a, it's an anonymous person that has asked that question. <laughs> um, um, right. So, whether I agree, no, I, I definitely disagree with uh, saying that the transnational right is decolonial. One, because um, to me, that is a, a, a very problematic kind of use of the term decolonial, which is the existence. I mean, it's a very hard one thing to be talking about decolonial thought. Uh, and to what it means to decolonize and to sort of give that away to a project which is, which is essentially anything but decolonial in its ethics. Uh, I would first of all not want to do that, uh, you know, as um, sort of uh, in, in intellectual terms. And I also think that it is not uh, that these are terms with specific histories, meanings, and thoughts attached to them. Whether we use a term like post-colonial with or without a hyphen, decolonial, or uh, or, um, or or anti-colonial, and these projects are not anti-colonial. They are certainly, you know, they they, can, they are in some sense post colonial without the hyphen, uh, they're definitely not decolonial. And, uh, you know, because uh, they're, they're not decolonial because they are ethically not decolonial. They don't actually even claim to be decolonial. They just claim to be opposing certain aspects of an other, which is, you know, which is really driven by that history, the history of the colonial kind of past that is rehearsed by, by them. Uh, and it reifies, I think, this idea of what, you know, what the, th these uh, kind of billiard ball states and who leads them. And I don't think that it's, it's as, uh, as straightforward as that. Also, the, you know, the, if you think about the fact that even, even with, with people from there, you know, so Indian diaspora, if, if someone, if the same sorts of people in the same sorts of places outside the country can be labeled as you are not here and you have no business talking about us because you don't live here versus, oh my God, we are so proud of you. You are what bring us glory. But that again can vary on whether that person's, what that person's caste is, what that person's religion is. Uh, and and where that which which and even region even even region in that sense. I mean, I haven't even uh, spoken about Kashmir properly here, but um, there's a there's a whole way in which that that gets gets used. Um, and and it, there again, I think the birth boundary argument gets quite mm. complicated. Um, there is a question here, Natasha, uh, about the uh, the the opposition parties, uh, candidates, and so on, like Obama paving the way for Trump. Uh, and the role of Congress, perhaps, uh, in paving the way towards the BJP, so that that is the weakness of leadership, the failure of the to solve the big economic and other problems. So, to what extent do you think that that uh, that previous period of failure actually builds the basis upon which or the political terrain which so, paves the way to Hindu yeah. and so on? One, I I don't believe in the sort of I mean. 
believe is probably the wrong word. I think I would want to stand up and argue against the sorts of equivalences that um, that make people uh, say that, oh, well, it's all the same. I don't think it's all the same. Uh, you know, it's uh, so for instance, Gandhi may have uh, had a hundred problems, but that doesn't mean that it's, you know, on, on caste, but that doesn't mean he's the same as the guy who assassinated him. I okay. don't think that these, these leaders are all the same. I don't think Obama is the same as Trump. I don't think Modi is the same as uh, th those who, I mean, from a certain point of view, people say, oh, well, you know, all, every nationalist leader in india has been the same in kashmir yes but the but the modalities through which the 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 ways in which they kind of carry out their plans are different um i think that um i also want to give due credence and uh, I, for me it's really interesting to to see to analyze how this right wing these right wing projects build their hegemony so i don't want to say it's simply reaction to what failed before i mean that it's also you know partly like a it could be various things i mean it's a it's a problem also of counterfactuals how do we know that this is what would have resulted if they had been different i mean there's a mm -hmm. i i don't think that's 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 logically not persuasive to me to say that it's simply because the previous leaders failed uh, you can have you have instances where you know perfectly capable leaders lose to these projects i mean if, if i think of someone like uh, the the hillary versus hillary trump versus trump i mean uh, hillary um, clinton versus trump uh, thing it, it was it i mean you know at the time people started to say well it's because she was this and that it, it uh, to me the reason people voted for trump is because they wanted to vote for trump uh, and and part of that is of course how hillary clinton was vilified uh, but it was also a, a kind of a vote for trump likewise i think in the indian case or even here in the in the i mean is it honestly is there any way in which speaking just of individuals that if you look at boris johnson and if you look at jeremy corbyn i mean there is no way you would think he's a he's a kind of you know more coherent organized efficient as a leader um so i think that these are not just about what what else is on offer is bad i think this is about i'll go back to critical thinking education not understanding that uh, you know attacks on everything public are being made at the same time as the idea of the people is valorized all of that has has for me kind of this big historical echo and that this happens because of the ways in which people are are kind of tutored inculcated into not uh, you know not caring being indifferent and and uh, not not asking questions of power so in, in the indian case i mean yes there was a lot of things that that congress government could have done differently uh, and they, they had that anti-corruption movement. But I think that that what what preceded Modi's, uh, you know, what enabled Modi's rise to power was really the RSS and the corporates. And again, the, the role of the corporates was such that, so for instance, you would have these, you know, Aban, Andan, Aban, Ambani Adani, they have such kind of resonant names, these, these kind of, you know, the billionaires backing him, that they would sort of, you know, on their channels, on their things, announce on their papers, announce that there's a wave and and it would do well and they made money out of it so it was literally like a very symbiotic relationship between the corporates who was who were supporting this um you know him and his party uh literally to the extent that i think in the 24 that the the last campaign was the most amount of money that was spent anywhere on any election in the world that amount of kind of funding uh thing uh, and i think in the in the previous elections too there was apparently not a single night that that modi did not return home because he had like all of these private uh you know helicopters that were doing that for him so it's it's a kind of you know there's a there's a lot of money that has gone into these projects it's it's uh so to say that the you know it, it was the congress i mean you you go anywhere there's just like the faces it's impossible to avoid any billboard any newspaper any magazine the faces everywhere there's massive amounts of finance that have gone into it not to mention in in these elections the way in which constitutional bodies have been subverted the way in which even election commissioners have been personally kind of you know there was this one commissioner who kind of who, who gave a dissenting opinion and he was kind of left out of meetings. So there's a lot of manipulation of regular constitutional principles that, and there's an important role played by media and an important role played by money, which for me is far more important that, than, you know, than the idea that the previous government wasn't perfect. I mean, yeah, they weren't perfect, but the, the, the ideological and the financial algorithmic ways in which these projects have these resources uh, is is kind of unrivaled, as it were. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Natasha. It's really interesting. Again, as always, more questions than there is time to to direct to you. Uh, but thank you so much for your talk and your uh, handling of the questions.
We move now to uh, the third speaker, Mustafa. It's all yours. Um, all right. Many thanks, Indarjit and Jawaria, for organizing this great webinar series each week. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to participate in this panel. Also, many thanks to Tanya, Elliot, and other colleagues for making this happen. So in my short presentation, I would like to focus on some of the key puzzles and paradoxes of authoritarian right-wing populism. I mean, the rise and resilience of right-wing populism, as we all know, is a global phenomenon we observe in the global north and global south. It's now a structural trend in global politics, and we currently see backsliding in established democracies, hybrid cases, and authoritarian regimes simultaneously. So all three systems have been moving in a rightward direction in the democracy authoritarian axis. So this is a structural trend. And I think a holistic perspective would be useful to explore what's really going on and why. Um, by the way, um, this presentation is based on a paper I co-authored with Zia Unish. It's published last year in the International Spectator. So uh, in my presentation, I will particularly make the point that right-wing populism and the ways populist leaders manage their contradictions should be understood within the context of one, uh, economy identity nexus and two domestic foreign policy nexus and this is clearly a large topic and it's not possible for me to cover all puzzles and paradoxes in a short intervention so I want to highlight three key issues today within that broader context and I will refer to different countries and cases in order to substantiate my points as time allows. So the first dimension uh, I'm gonna highlight is about the political economy aspect of right-wing populist projects. I think authoritarian right-wing populist leaders are not naive about the political economy fundamentals of their projects. I mean, as the literature on populism highlights, populist leaders claim that they represent the will of the people, right, representing majority against the interest of privileged uh, elites. I mean, they undermine opposition by portraying them as the representatives of establishment rather than ordinary people. So that's how uh, um, uh, authoritarian populist leaders communicate, right? And examples about, I mean, Trump in the US, Orban in Hungary, Erdogan in Turkey, all communicate this anti-elite rhetoric in domestic and foreign policy. But even though right-wing populist leaders exploit anti-elite sentiment, their power is firmly embedded in their organic linkages to need uh, economic elites. I mean, new powerful business interests. I mean, in the Turkish case, for instance, the ruling elite has been shaping state market relations uh, in a way that new economic elites have been the prim primary beneficiaries in the construction, energy, and media sectors. And of course, those uh, business actors enjoy state support, support and lucrative deals in return for their political loyalty. So there's kind of a give and take relationship here, and there is a a comprehensive political economy fundamental. I mean, right-wing authoritarian populist leaders use political economy instruments in order to substantiate their support base and create new um, uh, uh, economic elites. And there's an interesting trend here, actually, because as scholars of democracy point out, one of the key aspects of the current democratic backsliding is it is incremental or step-by-step -step nature, right? I mean, populist leaders win through ballot box, and they gradually skew the playing field in their favor. So th this is what is happening in different countries. I mean, they do not abolish parliaments, but block opposition. I mean, they do not shut down courts, but pack them with cronies or control media through different instruments. And I think there's a political economy equivalent of this political process, which can be called market capture. Uh, that is authoritarian populist leaders pick winners and lo losers in the economy based on their loyalty. And they can do this due to weak state capacity, institutional uh, checks and balances. Um, we can bring several examples from um, Turkey, Hungary, Brazil, or elsewhere, where authoritarian populist leaders advance particular political economy projects. I mean, although they run their campaigns on an anti-corruption platform, right-wing populist leaders often susceptible to cronism, which is quite at odds with their uh, original anti-elite discourse. So this is uh, number one I, I would like to highlight. I mean, they are not naive about the political economy fundamentals of their projects and they are 
uh, quite keen on creating new economic elites and they find strong supporters in different regions and countries, I will say. But we can discuss this uh, aspect in more detail in the q and session. So the second dimension concerns the interface between economy and identity in populist projects. I think this also helps explaining how they sustain their performance and remain unexpectedly re resilient. I mean, in some of the explanations on populism, as we all know, there is a kind of a clear cut distinction right, between economic grievances and cultural factors as primary determinants of authoritarian right wing populism. I mean, several scholars rightly point out the failure of neoliberal hyper globalization policies, increasing income inequalities, and associated economic grievances as main drivers of populist turn in global politics. I mean, on the other hand, scholars such as Inglehart and Norris suggest that right-wing populism should be understood as a cultural backlash against post-materialist values, such as multiculturalism or cosmopolitanism. But we suggest in the paper that a sharp division between economic and identity-based motives might sometimes be misleading, because when we look how uh, authoritarian populist leaders operate, we see that they use a complex mixture of both dynamics. I mean, the complex mixture actually explain, explains the rise and resilience of right-wing populist leaders in diverse national contexts. Well, I mean, populist leaders clearly care about the economy, right? I mean, they frequently highlight the failures of conventional economic paradigm, particularly they criticize, I mean, neoliberal um, projects. And they clearly want high economic growth. They want to catch up with advanced countries, especially countries in the global south. And they like mega projects as national pride and prestige. Also, high and continuous economic growth matters for them because it kind of facilitates a vertical and horizontal redistribution. And it provides new uh, opportunities for them to establish kind of cross-class uh, coalitions. By the way, by vertical redistribution, I mean using economic resources to finance supportive business elites. And by horizontal redistribution, I mean using economic growth to finance social assistance and economic opportunities for middle and lower segments of society. But the paradox here is that most authoritarian right-wing projects fail to ensure long-term economic performance. I mean, if they remain in office for a long time, uh, after the first term, most of the time, they kind of, um, um, experience problems in terms of maintaining uh, robust economic performance. And there is no hard data actually supporting they managed to decrease income inequality in their countries, reduce poverty or switch to a production-based economic model, reversing financialization trend in global economy. So in terms of long-term economic development, um, authoritarian right-wing populist projects most of the time fail and we try to show this with reference to data and some uh, empirical evidence. However, the thing is that they still manage to survive. I mean, they, at least their resilience is um, more than, uh, 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 their resilience is more than expected or anticipated. And the reason is that I think they mainly rely on identity related factors at this point in order to manage material contradictions. I mean, even if right wing populist government's economic performance declines significantly, in deeply polarized societies, actually, they managed to sustain their support base at least longer than expected. I mean, we can talk about the recent uh, economic situation in Turkey in detail in order to make sense of what is going on in the country and how it translates into a political mobilization. But perhaps we can do this um, in the q and uh, session. So that is uh, number two. And the final point I want to share with you today is about the domestic foreign policy linkages. I think we should also take this as part of our explanation um, as a fundamental legitimating device for populist leaders. I mean, managing pop, uh, contradictions for populist leaders is not limited to economy identity nexus, I will say. I mean, if they encounter material contradictions, material problems, they switch to identity uh, related uh, uh, um, um, cleavage, cleavages, but that's not the on the side of the issue, I mean, the resilience of right-wing populism is also related to the populist leaders' quest for diverting public attention through an assertive foreign policy style. So foreign policy must be considered as a central feature of authoritarian right-wing populism. 
And of course, foreign policy scholars work on this issue extensively nowadays. So there's already an extensive literature on populist foreign policy. And there's also a political economy dimension in it. Active foreign engagement, often through the use or threat of force in regional conflicts can also become an instrument for shifting attention from domestic problems. Basically, populist leaders put the blame on foreign powers or external enemies in order to justify domestic economic and political failures. And a typical narrative we see in uh, Hungary, Brazil, Turkey, and other cases is that external enemies have their allies in domestic politics, which collectively constitute a security threat to the state and the nation. That's what uh, right-wing authoritarian populist leaders communicate in their language. I mean, this kind of argument then becomes a practical instrument for right-wing populists in positioning the people, in quotation marks, against enemies, again, in quotation marks. And there are several examples. For instance, Hungary's Orban used the European Union as the main target to utilize foreign policy as a domestic legitimating tool, especially when it comes to migration issue. Right? Erdogan in Turkey, for instance, communicates an anti-Western rhetoric and the previous American president, uh, Indrajit, uh, you are clearly an expert on this issue, Donald Trump, used foreign policy initiatives to maintain his popularity at home. So the point here is that, of course, people living in those countries are aware of ongoing economic or political problems. I mean, if, for instance, an economic crisis hits, of course, people are not happy about these developments. But the thing is that in crisis junctures, actually, populist leaders communicate a language that attributes blame to foreigners. I mean, the important point here is not material contradictions only. The thing is how individuals, I mean, voters interpret those developments. And populist leaders here actually switch from economy to identity, from domestic politics to foreign policy. I mean, it creates contradictions clearly, but they also come up with a kind of narrative to attribute blame or shift blame to uh, outsiders, external actors, and they, their domestic uh, co-conspirators. So uh, again, um, however, active promotion of securitization in foreign policy in a quest for populist dividend, that's what we call this process, often fails to provide national security and constructive foreign policy in the medium term. But populists do not care about long-term uh, um, uh, developments in their country. I mean, they focus on uh, uh, current developments and they just try to steer a course out of their crisis. Uh, also, however, that's my final point and I'm gonna stop. This does not mean that right-wing populist leaders resort to full-fledged autarky or pursue isolationist foreign policy. I mean, this issue has already been highlighted by previous speakers. Uh, in fact, they are trying to form transnational links to shape regional and global trends. I mean, this is a transnational moment in that sense, and those people are not anti-globalist from that point of view. Orban, for instance, has no intention to lead the European Union. Rather, he seeks to transform the EU from within uh, in cooperation with other like-minded populist leaders in Europe. So they should better be called as selective globalists. They are not uh, anti-globalists in my view. Um, I think it's time to wrap up. Just to summarize, um, I try to make the point in my presentation that authoritarian right-wing populism is a transnational phenomenon. I mean, we should look at the holistic uh, uh, picture and in a shifting international order, I think right-wing populist projects should be understood within the context of an economy identity nexus and also within the context of domestic foreign policy nexus. I think I should stop here. Many thanks for your time and patience. Great, thank you very much. It's very interesting the way in which you kind of, many of the threads and themes that Nicholas outlined and uh, Natasha too, you've kind of picked up and uh, concretized in a slightly different way with different cases. I guess one, one of the big questions which strikes me, and you kind of mentioned it in the way in which scapegoating is a key part of the technique of the right, is this idea of, a, uh, in the American case, it's used as, a, as an idea to explain why poor white people have historically supported policies which have kept them where they are as, well, as long as black people in their neighborhoods and so on are even lower than them. And I, I, they talk about a kind of a psychological wage of whiteness that you don't get much economic uh, improvement in your life 
but you're willing to pay the price uh, because psychologically there is someone that you are superior to, if you like, in terms of uh, being part of the dominant group or whatever. I get the impression that scapegoating is a very powerful factor which retains support despite the fact, as you say, economic inequality, uh, standards of living and so on don't tend to improve very much in the long run for a lot of the voters uh, or the people who back these uh, Erdogan and so on, but yet they cling to that cultural identity, that sort of psychological wage of being in that dominant cultural block. I mean, how, how long do you think something like that can be sustained? Well, that's an excellent question, uh, Indarjit. I think um, a similar process going on in Turkey right now. I mean, previous speakers also made reference to the uh, uh, way economic crisis is communicated by Turkish president, right? I mean, he recently declared that Turkey is actually fighting a war of economic independence. And the thing is that if you look at the last decade or so, economic policies implemented by the government in the country did not help poorer segments of society. Mm -hmm. I mean, Turkish lira is in free fall, uh, inflation is on the rise, unemployment has always been quite high. But still, when we look at the support base of the ruling party, we see that um, uh, lower segments also support uh, just and development party a lot. And actually, this shows us that it's not only about economy. I mean, that's why actually we try to highlight this point in our paper. I mean, just putting cultural factors uh, on the opposite side of the um, discussion and saying that it's either economy or uh, culture. I don't think that, I mean, in especially certain cases, the situation does not work like that. I mean, this is actually what explains the strength of authoritarian leaders. I mean, uh, authoritarian populist leaders. Actually, first of all, they use a plain language. I mean, they just speak through uh, jargon pre language. They I mean, form simple sentences and they directly speak to ordinary people. And actually they communicate, for instance, in the Turkish context that the current government is the protector of their cultural rights, is the protector of their religious rights. If the government goes, I mean, their rights will also uh, will be gone. So this is the kind of rhetoric communicated. And at, at some point, actually a trade-off emerges actually for those people. I mean, either they are gonna go for their economic uh, interests, or either they will buy the narrative communicated by uh, authoritarian populist leaders. And actually, what is the breaking point? What's the tipping point? I'm not sure. Uh, for instance, um, we will see I mean, over the next two years will be really interesting to test this hypothesis because, you know, in Hungary, there is an election uh, in 2022, and in Turkey, it's going to be in 2023, if not. It's going to be earlier. So in Brazil, we will also see what will happen. So until we see the election results, most probably it will not be easy for us to understand when people say enough is enough. Because the problem here is that, I mean, these populist leaders also operate within the context of an authoritarian environment, right? It's not easy for individuals to speak up. It's not easy to express their genuine preferences. And here, I think Timur Kran makes a very useful distinction. He says that, I mean, a professor from a political science professor from Duke University, he says that in especially authoritarian settings, individuals have public preferences and private preferences, and they do not always overlap. I mean, they know they are going to pay a high price if they speak um, true to power. So they keep their genuine feelings to themselves. But if an emerge opportunity emerges, then they just switch to their private. Uh, preferences and their private preferences turn out to be public preferences. So, I mean, we are talking about uh, authoritarian domestic settings to a significant extent. I mean, perhaps uh, they are not completely authoritarian states or established authoritarian states, but uh, we are still talking about competitive authoritarian regimes. So being an opposition figure uh, means paying a high price for what they say, what they believe, what they argue. So I don't have a clear cut answer to this question, honestly, but clearly there is, there is a tipping point here because people will not tolerate this trade off indefinitely. I just wonder, given your comparative uh, thinking and research, as well as Nicholas's and Natasha's as well, that you are looking at kind of cross national, but also kind of comparatively, that what do you think of the idea that the resilience of a system 
to authoritarian leaders and movements uh, is partly dependent on the depth of the structures, democratic structures or structures of the state which are not easily manipulated or, or used. Um, that, that is what is the distinction uh, in different systems. So I'm just thinking in terms of like last year's general elect presidential election in the United States and the, the systematic attempt to basically uh, declare the election illegitimate by Trump, try to use the courts, pressure on uh, local election officials, you know, in every, pretty much every part of the country, uh, big section of the media uh, echoing that kind of line. Yet there's a defeat for him and he is, despite 6th of January, he's gone, although he's still hanging around in various ways. I just wonder in India, for example, those deep structures probably of the courts uh, of parliament and other protections, constitutional protections, perhaps are not as strong maybe as the US appeared to be at that time. And perhaps that's the same in Turkey as well. So I don't know, I, I'm just sort of thinking out loud. It, there are deep structures in different societies at different levels of strength. And I, I wonder if it's the variation in those which enables or disables or allows the challenges to work. In a sense, I mean, if I may talk for uh, for the Indian case, I think in a sense, I don't know if we could generalize across the range of structures, but yes, certain kinds of things are more, uh, so for instance, I think the media in the US case was a lot more, um, you know, pushed back a lot more than in, than in the Indian case, the media has been able to in the case of Modi. And that also depends on the extent to which the regime is, 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 um, is able to use violence against dissenters or, or to kind of really punish them. And I think that, you know, for something like, uh, if I think about something like the farmers protests in India and what the, the cost that the farmers endured, the number of lives lost and the resilience with which they just sat there and refused to budge, uh, you know, and 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 until Modi, for you know, in how, in this kind of very problematic spiritual talk way that he did, but he did reverse it. I think that that sort of thing. I I don't know honestly. I don't think I can imagine that happening here. Like I I don't think I can imagine that sort of political mobilization happening here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm thinking back to a few years ago this Hansard uh, report on you know the worry about the rise of authoritarianism in the UK. So I feel that it's if the reason I'm being like this cautious is because I don't want to generalize to say, yes, there are older established democracies which have deeper structures and which will withstand this and the, you know, the kind of the, the, those elsewhere places which can't, because I think that the human cost to people who are speaking up against this in India uh, is, is enormous and they're still doing that in ways that I can literally not imagine, imagine happening in some of the oldest democracies. Oh. And also for me, it kind of varies on which bit. So I think that the courts are variable in the Indian case, the media does much worse than the US, but uh, there are other, you know, but, but in terms of students and, and uh, intellectuals and activists, most of whom now are in prison, um, without, you know, without even charges. So it's, it's, um, it's variable. I, I just would not want to generalize around, uh, along the length of length of democracy and and depth of structures in a way that compares states as a whole. I would say it varies um, depending on which bit of the structure when one is talking about what safeguards are there and how many people just assume that this sort of thing happens there. Whereas if it happens here, it would be like, oh my God, how can it happen here? So, yeah. no, but I think there are variations even within so-called more established uh, systems as well. Nicholas, did you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, just uh, sort of a, a question and a comment, uh, I guess. I mean, so, so kind of two, two points that have come out of this, I think, are really interesting. The first is this, this point about institutions, which I, I'd like to make a comment on, but, but also the kind of point about, you know, whether they, whether they make, make um, you know, whether they actually succeed economically. I actually, um, Sean Stiles has actually sort of slightly stolen my thunder by asking the same question in the, in the Q&A, but uh, I'm going to ask a slightly different version of it, which is that, I mean, uh, actually it's to the same point, basically, in both spaces. Is there that deep trust in democracy, even in its home, anymore? I mean, like, realistically, I mean, isn't this the problem? Isn't, isn't the problem fundamentally that in all the places that are supposed to have these incredibly deep institutions, there's an absolutely tight, massive number of people who A, don't vote, and B, think that the entire political establishment is literally built to rob them. And they have, like, a fair amount of evidence to support this because they've got poorer and poorer over the last sort of 20-odd years. So... So I, I wonder if, if, 
if saying, asking the question about the depth of institutions or asking the question about how much do they really improve the living standards is slightly, uh, I think maybe if we look at it in a slightly different way and say the source of the, the transnational far right is a fundamental loss of faith in, in the model of liberal democracy. It's, it's quite deep and it's quite substantive and it's, and it's based on a whole variety of things. Uh, it's based on militarism, it's based on failed economic promises, it's failed, based on failed democratic promises. So I guess my question, and to frame this as a question for, for Mustafa, and I thought your talk was super interesting, so thank you, is, is um, I mean, I, I, the way in which you answer it is that basically they, they ignore, they hide the economic failures with, with um, cultural arguments. I, I wonder if, if, if the, the way in which they would respond, I'm not, I'm not obviously one of their supporters, is that, is that the problem is that the economic strategies being framed outside the cultural argument have failed, right? So their argument is precisely that, only the turn to culture is the solution to the economic problems. So, you know, as in for them, the, the story is inverted. It's not one or the other, it's via here to get to there. Or does that make sense to you in terms of the Turkish? context, but uh, maybe it doesn't. I'd just be interested in hearing your reflections, Mustafa. Okay, Mustafa, you have the last word uh, in your segment. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, I think it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that's what is going on in the country to a significant extent. And um, another important point related to our discussion, actually, it's about the institutional uh, uh, capacity. I mean, that's why actually in my presentation, I raised the issue of state capacity or institutional capacity. I mean, in the United uh, States, for instance, Donald Trump could not win elections right last year, but uh, in 2020. But if he managed to win elections, and what would the American democracy look like uh, over the next five or six years or so? And the point is that if authoritarian populist leaders have the opportunity to remain in power long enough, they change institutions, they uh, subvert institutions in a way that they skill the playing field in their favor. And it becomes extremely difficult for opposition forces to make their voices heard. Because as said, they are not, from a political economy point, they are not naive. I mean, they, they create their new economic elite. They create actually a strong support base. And all these people actually know that they win because they support existing government. So it's not something going on with reference to Marx dynamics. I mean, it is all based on their political loyalty and the usual perks and privileges they get in return. So in the Turkish context, part of the explanation, I think, concerns the uh, longevity of the uh, current government. I mean, I mean, they have been ruling the country since 2002. It means almost two decades. Now they had the opportunity to control different state institutions, to control civil society. As a result, actually, a kind of uh, democratic comeback has become uh, more difficult. But on the other hand, it also shows the resilience of opposition in the country. I mean, there's still a vibrant uh, opposition. I mean, opposition parties are uh, quite robust, especially given the fact that they are operating in a restrictive institutional environment. Civil society, I think, is still um, vibrant as much as it can be. So uh, I think the, 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 the Turkish case is interesting because it, on the one hand, it shows the resilience of authoritarian populist projects, but it also implies how fragile they are. That's why actually it's really difficult to make predictions and whether they will be able to um, manage their contradictions as they, they used to be able to do in the following, in the previous decade or so. So probably that's how I see the situation. Great, thank you so much. There's so many interesting variations and kind of confusions and threads which uh, cross it is, it is a fascinating area. Uh, but thank you, Mustafa, that's really interesting. Um, uh, we move on now to uh, Sheehan, who is our final speaker. I remember when we had something about the transnational right a few weeks or months ago, uh, Sheehan was in touch with me on Twitter saying, why didn't we also talk about China? And I said, on that occasion, we didn't but we might at some other point, and guess what? We have someone, uh, we have Shein <laughs> at this, so, so he can tell us a little bit more about uh, the situation in China as well. So over to you, Shein. Um, thanks a lot. Um, this conversation uh, has become so fascinating uh, that I got a little bit of carry away. Uh, so in that case, uh, before uh, I, I uh, do uh, my regular presentation, I would like to offer uh, three uh, short comments. 
one is um, recently uh, we had a workshop on temporality and crisis. Um, if we look at uh, the rise of global right as a crisis, then the question we ask is, what's the temporality of it? Is that a ongoing converse, conversation, ongoing crisis, or that is something uh, deeply uh, structured and embedded in uh, the global system? Um, so in that, sense, in that sense, right, this is the reason that I'm doing uh, this presentation and uh, I'm starting a new research project that is, as a historian, uh, I'm quite reluctant to talk about contemporary issues because that is not my expertise. Rather, uh, in this project, I'm looking into the historical origins of this rise uh, of the complex feelings uh, towards liberalism and maybe related to the rise of uh, 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 authoritarianism in China. So in other words, I'm using a historical approach um, uh, to tackle a contemporary problem. And also, I have to uh, 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 be honest that this is a research project that I, that I just got started. Uh, it's a book project. I have two uh, chapters, uh, draft chapters written, but this is a uh, book long project. So some ideas here are um, immature, but I would really love to hear uh, comments and feedbacks from audience and uh, uh, scholars here. Let me get started. Um, today, a lot of people are talking about the rise of China. The rise of China may change the world. The rise of China may give us another Cold War. As people talk about the issue with fear and the trepidity, right? So people are feared about China. And people in China are also looking at the world with lots of anxiety and uncertainty. When they come to China, a very basic question still needs to be answered. That is, what is China? Is China a nation, state, empire, or civilization? If it were a nation, then who were the Chinese people? Or who are the Chinese people? The Han people? If a state, is Taiwan part of that? And how about China's relationship with uh, Tibet and Hong Kong? And is there any real unchanged core right, of Chinese civilization running through historical time and global space? So far, the studies on the China question uh, follow three general approaches. First, scholars inside the country often follow a indigenous intellectual tradition and they examine key aspects related to the formation of China as a modern concept, tracing their historical origins. They tend to treat China as a continuous historical entity evolving over the long duty of historical time. In other words, they believe that there's something holding China together, be it culture, ideology, or national spirit. Second, an increasing number of professional scholars and political activists outside the country adopted an analytical approach that questioned the very ancients of China as a continuous civilization in history and its integrity as unitary political entity in politics. To name just one example, in recent book, um, The Invention of China, Bill Hayton documents how the modern notion of China was invented as a homogeneous political entity by a small group of intellectuals in, in the face of historical reality. In works that follow this approach, the contention is not whether or not China is imagined, but rather how China is imagined. Third, a group of scholars, primarily historians working outside of China, have shifted away from the attempt to construct mass narratives on what China means, and adopted a frontier history approach to investigating how the Middle Kingdom's involvement and the interaction with its bordering neighbors. These scholars place the formation and the transformation of the Chinese state within the context of Asian, inner Asian, East Asian, and the Southeast Asian connections and the entanglements. In other words, these scholars study China by focusing on how China historically evolved through its interactions with its neighbors. In this project, I will neither offer another perspective on what China is, nor attempt to study another border region. For there's already enough research on both. Rather, 
I would like to introduce a historicist approach to investigating the power relationship that shaped the process of receiving and rejecting certain discourses about China. Two examples. One look at, uh, the first example look, looks at uh, contemporary debates. In focusing on Chinese intellectuals, Gloria Davis has already engaged the China question in such a way. In worrying about China, she critically examined the debates among contemporary intellectuals on how to achieve national perfection. She points out that these intellectuals often assume a sense of moral responsibility while discussing China. The other looks at, uh, looks at uh, global context. For example, Fabio Lanza investigates what China meant to the left activists in the West in the 1960s and 70s in the context of global Maoism. Maoism China became a viable interaction to global capitalism. I appreciate both approaches, but I see the China question not as a contemporary problem, but the one deeply rooted in this country's troubling relationship with the modernizing world. In other words, in my project, I'll try to further historicize the China question and uh, uncover the stream of emotional politics that run behind it. The theme for this panel is the transnational right in world politics. And the title for my book project is The Right to Talk About China. Here, I have to clarify my position on the using of the term right. This right is not that right. On this term, three premises have to be established. First, in the transnational context, the right I refer here in the title of my book is not a right of legality. It is a right of self-perception. No international treaties, at least from my channel knowledge, have regulated on how people outside of China to talk about China. Therefore, Chinese cannot do anything legally against those non-Chinese who contradict their self-perceived right on how to talk about this country. Second, it is a right of imagination. Some Chinese scholars believe Chinese culture is appealing and the foreigners have not yet fully understood it. They imagine that one day foreigners could potentially come around and convert to that culture. Third, one party's very action against this self-perceived right often provokes emotion responses from the other party. Using the China question example, in the months leading to 2008 Beijing Olympic Games, the term national humiliation appeared 88 times in China daily the CCP's flagship leadership uh, newspaper. In a similar tone, 19 centuries, uh, countries and organizations had heard the feelings of the Chinese people. Today, China's political discourses is uh, tainted with emotional feelings, shame, glory, frustration, humiliation, and anger are the buzzwords that Beijing often refers to while discussing to the world. In this sense, if the right to talk about China is not a right of legality, it is a right of emotions. Based on these observations, I contend in my project that we cannot arrive at a consensus on the China question, not because we do not know enough about the subject matter. Rather, the challenge is the question has become so emotionally charged that a rational conversation about it has become seemingly impossible. Behind it, it is the acting of a type of emotional politics that rejects anyone that does not fit into certain stereotypes the right to talk about the country. In the China field, there has been already uh, some very good research on emotional politics, uh, especially the history of it, such as Eugenia Lin's study on the rights of public, uh, public sympathy in, in the Republic period, the Chinese chapter on how imperial powers perceive China's legal system through sentiments, and the Christopher Reed's work on humor, and etc. In dialogue with these works, my project will investigate how anger, frustration, and the passion affected people's view on the China question. And how do I do my uh, research about the emotions? I'm an intellectual historian, and in my research. I try to place human agency at the center. 
In this book, I select some leading Chinese intellectuals based on three criteria. criteria. They were influential, they were nonpartisan, and they had made sincere efforts to talk about China in their works. In study with them, with appreciation of contingency in history. I choose five moment, moments in the 20th century when these individuals were engaging discussions on the China question. By both zooming in, looking into these moments and zooming out, contextualizing these moments, I have identified several factors that contributed to the rise of emotional politics among Chinese intellectuals of the 20th century. First is about identity. I start with a well-known liberal intellectual, a would-be leader in Chinese politics, Jiang Tingfu in the 1910s. When he studied in the United States, he resented, he resented the way in which American missionaries talked about China. He knew what they talked about was probably right, but he just felt uncomfortable when foreigners talking about China negatively. Second is about gender. I look into a controversy in the 1930s. A feminist writer, Chen Hongzhe, wrote about her family's journey to Sichuan, but she was pushed back by the public sentiments from that region. So much so, her husband had to resign from his position and the family had to leave Sichuan because she has a province in China. The third is about the scholarly expertise. I examine the scholarly tensions between traditional ways of studying China through theories in the 1940s. We can see how some scholars became so opinionated with different scholarly approaches. They look down upon those scholars who, can, who they consider as outsiders. Fourth is about cultural devotion. Examining a scholar debate on new methods to study Qing history, which is the last dynasty in China, I present a case where some scholars rejected and they even became infuriated with their colleagues' efforts to deconstruct Chinese history. And the last one is about one's position with the mainstream views of the time. And here I use the example of Lin Yutang, who was widely regarded as a spokesman of China in America before 1942. Yet he suddenly lost the media's favor and fell into silence as his view on China became against the mainstream view in the United States. These individuals came from various intellectual and political backgrounds, but they all share the same concern with China's position in the world. The external pressure of Western imperialism and the internal struggle of gender and academic politics induced their emotional views on who had the right to talk about time. Here is my hypothesis. Who has the right to talk about time? This is not just a question about intellectual perspective, but also social positioning. And this social positioning is a byproduct of the resistance to and the backlash of the imbalanced knowledge production and the cultural exchange within Chinese society, as well as in the wider world. The exchange with the outside world, as scholars have long pointed out, is often accompanied by the introduction, adoption, circulation, and appropriation of nationalism, colonialism, imperialism, between and among empires, nation states, and the would-be nations. Therefore, being beyond national history, I consider this project a study of a social production of China-related knowledge in the context of China's interaction and the entanglement with the modernizing world of the 20th century. This project is significant beyond the discipline of history. While examining Chinese states' international behavior, Foreign observers often point to the vulnerability of Chinese national psychology, uh, stating that Chinese nationalism can be oftentimes emotional and sometimes irrational. Yet they fail to notice one critical source of tension that is, as China in dialogue with the world, the spokesmen and women from China and their foreign counterparts 
all of them have divergent views on who has the right to talk about country, even before agreeing upon what China is. Thus, the project will be an intervention into the current study of international relations based on vigorous research on primary sources in Chinese intellectual history. It speaks to the growing interest in the China question among public intellectuals and the policymakers. One last point. In this way, the project also encourages researchers to rethink the unintended consequences caused by the iron rule of the rationality regime that grew out of the European Enlightenment tradition. While a significant portion of society is constantly ne neglected, marginalized, and dismissed by the knowledge regime of nation rationality, what would happen to their repressed feelings? What has happened to the Brexit in the UK and the Trumpism in the United States offers us a gleam of possibilities. To acknowledge this point, this project will not be one sided critique of the irrational nationalism that has already been well documented in academic discourses in China today, for it also recognizes that Eurocentric bias and Orientalist tendencies have contributed to the current discussion of the China question in the West. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. That is so interesting and so rich. And uh, I must admit, it's very difficult to know where to where to start uh, with, the, with the question. So I, I, I'm hoping someone in the Q&A will be able to, um, ah, and Sean Stars has saved the day. Um, one of my colleagues at City, he says, uh, would you say that Xi's emotional politics has similarities with Trump's rhetoric that the world is laughing at us, that we don't win anymore, and things like MAGA versus the, the you know, making the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Both talk about humiliation and overcoming it, the politics of victimhood that seems to play well domestically, but is totally ineffective overseas at changing opinions and foreign policies. Oh, this is a really interesting question. And uh, um, um, again, I'm not a political scientist, so uh, um, I try mm -hmm. to avoid uh, contemporary affairs. Uh, but just, let me just uh, say a few words on this issue. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a workshop on theorizing anti-colonialism. Uh, so basically, uh, scholars are from different fields in history. Together, we uh, look at uh, the rise of anti-colonialism and uh, uh, also related to anti-colonial nationalism. And someone in the audience made a very good comment. That is, uh, he said, well, it seems that someone's anti-colonialism is someone's colonialism. I think this, uh, this point makes a really a powerful, um, um, uh, I guess, impact on me. That is, um, when we're looking at uh, the global circulation of knowledge, it's really difficult to find the origin. Hmm. You know, uh, it's, it's not about who inventing what, rather it's about the spectacle, right? Of the circulation of analogies, comparisons, and feelings, emotions in the international politics. So here, it's really interesting to observe that uh, uh, Trump picks up some emotional aspect of politics, perhaps from other parts of the world. I'm not sure there's a genealogy between Trump and Xi uh, in terms of this very idea. But one example uh, I could use is, you know, in China, there's a famous saying uh, be, uh, by the time of the founding of the People's Republic, Chairman Mao announced the Chinese people uh, has stood up, right? This is the very uh, signature saying uh, that he used in 1949 at the time of the founding of the People's Republic of China. A couple of years ago, Australian uh, Prime Minister used the same words, right? Saying now the Australian people has stood up to the Chinese. And so in that case, I guess the global uh, interaction, right? A global, um, I guess the rise of China um, changed uh, the, 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 the balance of this global conversation and creates a very, this sort of entanglement of using and uh, sometimes abusing certain uh, um, uh, historical analogies and historical references. So that, that, that is my way to uh, respond to the question. I'm not sure if I fully uh, 
uh, I'm able to fully answer the question, but that's my perspective as a historian. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, Natasha, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, thank you, Sheen, for that talk. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, uh, it's really interesting. I wanted to, um, well, also say exactly about, you know, this commonality of, of words um, between the slogans used by Modi supporters in 2014 and by Trump supporters in 2016. Uh, uh, eerily similar, Abki Bar Trump Sarkar is what Trump said, which was Abki Bar Modi Sarkar, this time Trump government or a Modi government. Um, Okay, I, my question to you is, so you know that that very kind of nice, wonderful way in which you phrased that, and you said it's a study of the social production of China-related knowledge in connection with, can you just complete the rest of that sentence so I can ask my question correctly, um, in connection with China's interaction with, what was the thing that followed it? Oh, oh, with, 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 the, with the international, uh, with the global interaction and the global entanglement. Yes. So there, my question to you is, do you find, I mean, as a project, it's just so fascinating. And do you find that there is a difference based on what, you know, until now, in, in how that was with splitting the global into the imperialist from the Chinese point of view and the rest, the rest of the world, you know, the regional countries and the others which were not seen in the way that the West was. Is there, is, are there any differences in that, systematic differences in the study of that social production of knowledge where China is relating with, with specific countries that it sees as its kind of other, as opposed to others that, other countries that are not seen in the same way? Oh, this is a great question. And this question uh, has been uh, always on my mind. Uh, that is, uh, when I was a graduate student, I uh, read a lot of uh, uh, post-colonial literature and I love it, right? I, I think the, the first book uh, I wrote about uh, world history and the national identity in China, um, I was heavily influenced by post-colonial theories, uh, but I did not cite anything. Um, it seems that there is a strong opinion among China scholars that is um, uh, post-colonialism does not apply to China because China is never a colonial, fully colonized country. Um, but on the same time, at the same time, I do feel um, that uh, um, when we are dealing with the issue of, in China, we're not just looking at the issues in China alone on its own. Really, we're looking at a way um, that uh, we can use a local case to speak of some global concerns. So um, um, to be specific um, about this issue, um, when we're looking, for example, uh, when we're looking at uh, Xi Jinping's uh, view on the world and uh, um, Modi's view on the world and uh, um, perhaps Trump's view on the world. Um, one way of doing that is we follow the traditional historiography, right? To seek for a lineage, to, to, to reconstruct a teleology, right? From one point to another. But I think um, I feel most beneficial from post-colonial literature that is, it's time for us to rethink this teleology. It's not about who is influencing who. Rather, it is the structural issue we face in this global culture. Uh, so the other day I had a meeting with, uh, I, had a, I had a chat with a friend who uh, works uh, in World Bank. And he talks about that he's managing some projects to help education uh, in a third world country or uh, the countries in the South, global South. And he basically, what he does is uh, he works with the local agency, right, to reform the school curriculum and to offer low interest loan to these schools in the global south. And then I asked him, how about the United States? How about a belt, a belt a, you know, rust the belt in the United States? For example, I'm teaching in uh, Western New York. We are in trouble. And the trouble we're facing is deeply, uh, you know, it's, it's, so in other words, we can actually apply some ideas of, from post-colonial studies to understanding uh, issues in the United States as well as in China. So I guess uh, I'm uh, probably I belong to the global theory part. I think we use uh, local references and we look into the complex feelings in the local, but fundamentally all of us are trying to tell a global story. Hopefully this uh, makes sense to you. So, uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I've spent the best part of last several years, if not the decade, kind of trying to argue precisely why post-colonialism is relevant in countries that are not colonized. 
um, you know, and, and also that the legacy, neither human rights nor the ability to colonize is actually exclusively the reserve of any part of the world. If we look at India's actions in, in Kashmir, as I said, I mean, it's no different than a standard kind of colonial move. So there's that. And then there's also the fact that, as you said, there's the, uh, you know, there's, there's all of these colonial history didn't just happen elsewhere, neither, you know, it, it happened everywhere. So yes, I completely understand that. I was, um, I don't know if it's, it still makes sense, but the question that I was asking was more kind of about history, like in the way in which knowledge about China was made by people at the time then, was there a difference then in, in perception? That's, that's sort of, I don't know if that's making sense, but that's what I wanted to, I didn't know. I was like, you're preaching to the converted. That's uh, so essentially, I mean, you know, when I when I argue about something like the, the way in which the moral wound of colonialism gets used and how this is, you know, how post-colonial international relations is actually everyone's international relations and not just elsewhere. I, I completely agree with all of what you said. But my question is more specific to to kind of in in that past that you're talking about, because yeah. you know, not not contemporary era. And how did that was was that systematicity still evident? Was there were there any striking ways in which that came up? came out in your research? Absolutely. Thanks, Sorry. Uh, Marcus, for your yeah. I just, uh, Nicholas wants to come in with a question and, oh, okay. So you have the last word. Uh, uh, thank you, Nicholas, because um, we are running a little bit out over, over our time. So Sheehan, would you like to address uh, Natasha's last question? Absolutely. Uh, I love this question. And uh, um, I guess um, um, I'll start with the local. Um, in my book, uh, the first book on world history and the national identity in China, uh, I look at uh, some intellectuals in China. And uh, uh, when they were, uh, so these intellectuals were educated not inside China, but in the West. They were educated in the United States, in Europe, and other places in the world. Um, and when they were studying about China in other parts of the world, um, they felt a strong sense that they're being controlled. They're in a very unlucky position in the global circulation of historiography. In other words, they realize that the, the history of China is not written in China, right? It's written outside of China. And especially in the process of writing, um, the Chinese uh, scholarship or Chinese national feeling, right? Sometimes it's being consulted, but oftentimes not. So, but this actually is related to what I'm doing now, right? So when we are thinking about so-called our own history, this is probably also related to Nicholas uh, uh, research, right? This is, but this is sort of a nativist view on history. It is, sometimes you have you have this feeling that my history is being written by other people and these people don't understand us. And maybe there's a, a gender right behind the way in which they are writing about us. What should we do? Can we do anything? And in this case, right, in terms of Chinese historiography, they cannot do much. Right? They 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 read the people inside of China, they're writing in Chinese. And they're writing in a way that has been rarely translated in, uh, to the outside world, right? So they cannot do much. And if they cannot do much, where's, where's the outlet of their fee? And I'll use one example here. I'm not sure this is proper. Uh, remember Edward Said, throw a stone, right? Throw, the, throw a stone at the guardhouse. What is the emotion that uh, drove him to have that action? And how that action is being understood, right? In the West and in his native land. So I guess that's the, 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 the place where I should start my conversation. But uh, I really appreciate your question. I think um, this, this, gives, this gives me a lot to think. Thanks a lot, Natasha. Thank you so much, um, Shane uh, and Nicholas and Natasha and Mustafa, uh, incredibly rich uh, discussion. And I, I would have liked to ask a lot more kind of contemporary political questions to Xi'an about the way in which emotion, nationalism, and the feeling of kind of humiliation and so on is actually politically mobilized uh, within China and in its current politics as well, and what that might portend going forward. But we run out of time as usual, actually. But uh, I really wanna thank you everyone for your contributions and uh, 
your patience with everything and um, and for making the time to to speak with all of us. And I thank the audience also for their patience and perseverance as well on a Friday evening. And um, oh, actually, it's probably Friday afternoon for Jian as well. But uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, next week is the sixth of the six, the sixth one of the six webinars. We've got a panel of uh, four speakers who are going to talk about how do we do global knowledge? Um, how do we create global knowledge, global ideas and have global conversations, which are meaningful and take us further forward? So it's a kind of discussion about what this whole series and the other preceding series are really trying to do and uh, about and problematizing this idea of global knowledge. Can we even do it? Uh, what does it look like when we are doing it? And so on. So I think it should be a really interesting discussion to, to round off this particular series. So see you hopefully next week at 4 p.m. But for now, thanks very much, everyone. And um, and uh, yeah, see you again very soon. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.